got lots of people online ready to join our seminar today. So welcome everybody. Welcome to today's National Science Week ARI seminar. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which we're meeting today right across Victoria and potentially beyond as well. I pay my respects to elders past and present and to any First Nations people who are with us today. I'm joining you today from beautiful Tungarong country and really I'm happy to be here. Today, as I mentioned at the start, it is National Science Week. There are all sorts of things happening this week. And of course, I also acknowledge that we do regard Aboriginal people as the first scientists in this nation. Today, we're learning some really exciting work from some data masters at ARI. Um, masterful, extraordinary and innovative things being done with data. We've got two speakers, Pete Griffin and Jan Yen, and we're going to hear about some brand new innovation around identifying frog calls using deep learning AI. And we're going to hear from Jan after Pete about how do we know that ecological models are robust? We will have time for questions. Please type your questions into the question column there and um, we'll get to them afterwards um, and look forward to having you participate um, in this session today for National Science Week. So over to you, Pete. Hello, um, my name's Pete Griffin and uh, I've been working with Katie Howard and Louise Durkin and Lachlan Francis on identifying frogs, uh, frog calls using deep learning AI. I'll give you a quick project overview and I'll talk about the data collation, which there's a lot of data collected for this uh, project. I'll talk about model development, which we use to identify frogs from their recorded calls. And I'll talk about how we're going to use this uh, from our pilot study, which I'm presenting here to production. And then I'll mention the future and what are the implications of this type of research. The project driver behind this is that Louise Durkin and Katie Howard have been monitoring frogs along the Murray River to uh, check for the re their response to environmental watering. And as part of that, they're using these automated recorders, which will record frog calls for about two minutes uh, on a set time for a few hours per day. Now these are spread across various sites across the Murray, and they've been doing it for three years. Now, as a result, they've got about almost half a million files, 470,000 audio files. And to process these, to analyze them for what frogs are present and in what sort of numbers takes a lot of work. And currently they can process about 20 files per hour. Now, if they were to do at that rate, listening to those uh, and processing those files, it would take over two years, 24 hours a day of processing to get the sort of data that they need to do their research. So um, we decided that we try and automate this process and make it more accurate and allow them to get on with their research rather than just listening to files. The funders for, for this project were Jamie Malloy of the Office of Conservation Regulator and Lindy Lumsden at ARI. Now the first job of the pilot project was to collate all of these files into a database and that is such that we know where each file was taken so we have a location and all the specifications of the file and how many files we've got and all of that uh, extra information that is really useful for later analysis. We were going to develop a single species model and that means that we're going to try and identify one species at a time so, so our classification algorithm will just say what is the most likely species calling at a particular time. We would prefer that we get the correct species rather than the wrong species and if we're going to get the wrong species we'd prefer to ignore it and in uh, scientific speak that is we prefer false negatives to false positives. 
And obviously we have to process our 470,000 wave files efficiently. Now the frogs we were going to look at for this project include 14 species. Now not all of these occur along the Murray, so we've included some from other parts of Victoria, just to see how well we can differentiate between the various species. But frogs are not calling all the time, so we also have to have a class which is called not a frog. Not a frog takes in things like cockatoos, um, but also when the, all the frogs are quiet or other sounds of the bush or not native sounds such as human induced sounds. So the frogs with the um, asterisks there are not uh, generally along the Murray River or within the study areas. Now, in order to train a model to listen to frogs, we need samples of the model's calling. Now, before this project started, Katie Howard and Louise Durkin had spent many, many hours collating a huge database of calls. But during this project, Lachlan Francis developed this wonderful exemplar finding tool, which will make this process a lot easier in the future. What this tool does is open up a WAV file, allows us to look at the whole file, jump to certain areas within the file, listen to that, identify the frog by uh, clicking on the side and saying what species it is, and storing that data to the database for later use in training. These sorts of tools are essential for a project of this nature. We have assembled a very large database of frog calls, um, not as large as we'd like, but we've got about 93,000 labeled samples at this stage. And we've gone for uh, one and a half second samples. We've decided that about one and a half second of a frog call is enough to identify or differentiate between those species. Now, when you're creating models of this nature, generally you want to hold out a certain number of uh, data so that you can test your model against it. So we're keeping 70% of the data to train the model and 30% of the calls that we've identified we're withholding from the model and we'll pass those through the model later to see how well the model performs. So the last part is uh, using this test data set to work, work out just how well our model does perform. Now the sort of model we're going to use is a deep learning neural network. Uh, this is a little bit different from uh, standard machine learning in the deep learning neural networks uh, and particularly the type that we are using are very good at pattern recognition. The software we're running is uh, TensorFlow and that's free, freely available from Google. It runs on Python on a fairly powerful PC. Basically it's an upspec uh, gaming machine because we're going to be using the graphics card to do some of the calculations. And the type of network that we're de designing to identify these species is a 1D convolution deep neural network. Now that sounds like a, a really complex idea, but in general, if you have a look at it, it's not that difficult to understand. And I'll give you a quick overview now. Imagine we're trying to identify a theoretical frog called the do re mi frog and it makes the do re mi sound and we've we've able to detect on uh, audio files those three notes do re mi and so in our one and a half second sample of the frog call we could break that up into 0.5 of a second and listen for those three notes and we could have do re mi we go hey that's the do re mi frog but at the moment, we've only got these lights flashing. Those lights are neurons in the first layer of the neural net. And they switch on just like lights when they're activated. What we do in a deep, deep learning convolutional neural net is build up layers. And those layers are combinations of the features above them. So here we've got half a second do, re, mi notes. And we combine those on the second layer to one second sequences of do, do, re, re, um, do, re, et cetera. And then on the next layer, we get those one second sequences that are overlapping and combine those into one and a half second sequences. So you can see here that we're slowly building up a pattern of various notes. 
And when we get to the bottom, we have our frog labels. And then we use the network to point at the various frogs that we want. And so this would be the path through our network. We'd have the do re me at the start that are half a second apart. They get combined on the second layer to do re and re me. And on the third layer, they get combined to do re me. And then we say, hey, that's the right frog. That's the do re me frog, which is on the output layer. Now, what you will notice uh, here is that the more notes we have at the top, the more combinations we could have on that second layer. But also the more intervals we have at the top, the more layers we can make. So we can make this network fairly large and fairly wide and fairly deep. TensorFlow goes and makes the combinations for us and follows our instructions as to how to combine those combinations and, and via the training data makes those arrows to point at the correct label down the bottom. Now in our frog samples, we're using one and a half second data, uh, one and a half second sample, which equates to 72,000 numbers in our frog files. And this is what 72,000 numbers sound like. Now that was the southern brown tree frog. We go and break those 72,000 numbers into 1024 number windows. And so we get 70 samples, not three like we did for Do Re Mi, but we get 70 time samples. And each of those 70 time samples, we don't break into three notes, but we actually break into 65 frequencies and 35, uh, 34 other parameters. So that we end up with a final matrix of 70 by 99 numbers, which sounds like this. And that is used to hand onto TensorFlow. Then we have our we have a, a neural network that's very similar to what I described earlier, except that the only difference here is we have more layers in ours. And in ours, we've got 14 layers. And you can combine these in different ways to have different layers. It uh, varies, uh, and sometimes it works better, sometimes it works not as well. You've got to play around with this. It's not that difficult. But at the bottom, we've got our output of 14 frogs and the label of not a frog. So we go from the top, we create extremely complex uh, sequences of sounds and analyze those and eventually assign them a label. So in our samples that we've got, the 93,000, uh, this is the numbers of each species. As you can see, some of the species have very few exemplars. So Sloan's, for instance, only has six. So I think five of those ended up in the training data and only one ended up in the test. We included all the frogs we had just to see how well we could differentiate between them in this pilot. TensorFlow took about 20 minutes to churn through all that data and output a test accuracy of pretty much 98%. You'll notice the train accuracy on the training data set that was used to create the model was a bit higher, but that's generally overfit. You've got to hit, hold out that test data to see how well it handles data it hasn't seen. When you're assessing a classification model such as this, it's often useful to output this chart, which is called a confusion matrix. And on this confusion matrix, we have in the rows, the labels that we know that the frogs are, and in the columns, we have the labels that the model is assigning to the frog. And generally, we'd want all of those to line up exactly. And when that does, we end up with that main diagonal, which is colored orange, being fully populated by numbers. And we don't want numbers in the off diagonal because that means that what we think the frog is and what the model thinks the frog is are two different things. As you can see from that general shape of the confusion matrix, for scientists that is a confusion matrix to die for. It is just absolutely magnificent. And when we get it wrong, it's generally going into the last column, which is not a frog, which is one of the things that we've set out to do. And that can occur for a, a, 
uh, for various reasons. We could have birds calling over the top of frogs and things of that nature. Additionally, we've got some that we were thought were not a frog down the bottom row are being assigned to a frog. And that also can occur where we've, for instance, split up sounds of a bird calling and a frog has come in between and we've uh, detected that. Also, these off diagonal uh, areas could indicate where uh, the, either the model is getting it wrong or the label is wrong and these need to be checked. To have a look at individual frogs, so just some of those numbers, uh, you can see uh, across these four species here, we've got the number of exemplars that fell into the test category and what percentage of correct we got for those is on the second line. And as you can see, they're extremely high numbers and uh, very satisfying numbers to see. You can see that generally we don't get the wrong species. And if we do, it's only on the frogs that we don't have much training data for. And we're hoping with more training data that will disappear or minimized at least. And also when we do get it wrong, it generally goes into the not a frog category, which is what we hoped. To check these various anomalies of the model, uh, Lachlan has also created another great bit of software, which is this model validation software, which is like the reverse of the exemplar software. It can take the uh, predictions and it will go and find the individual file that that prediction was made from, pull up that file, pull up the exact one and a half second of that call, display that call, display the statistics of the model and allow you then to listen to that and say, all right, do I agree with the model or was the original label correct or is it something else entirely? And therefore mark that down for further training later on. So that is a really essential part of the modeling process is doing a model validation and reiterating if you've got errors in your data. At the end of the day, we want to process these 470,000 files and we've written the code to do that and we've been able to show that we can process those in about three days or less than three days. So that is a, a wonderful outcome and the software works really well. And when we do this, we predict every second of each file what is happening. And these results are directly loaded to the database along with all the other metadata from the files such that you can easily do an analysis straight away. Uh, here in the middle, we've got a, um, I'll just bring up the laser pointer quickly. We've got this graph here, which will, um, I'll show you this animation of passing through a section of a frog call file and seeing how the model performs as it uh, hears various frogs. Down the bottom here, we've got a spectrogram of that same file. And if you like, here are the volumes within the file or the powers uh, detected. Now I'll pre-warn you, listen for two different species in here and the darker blue, the color, the more likely that species is occurring. As you can see, the model fairly well just differentiated two species, some very light blue colors off some other species, but it was pretty confident that it was just occurring, getting those two species, common froglet and the eastern sign bearing froglet. Uh, in the middle here, perhaps they were both calling at the same time and it was a bit of a 60-40 proposition. Um, so during this pilot, we've been able to show three things, which is exactly what we set out to do, which was we were able to show we've got the ability to create this software, to develop the, the database required to drive the software and to create the model. So we've got that in-house ability. We were able to differentiate between the various frog species to a very high accuracy, which we were very pleased about. And we were able to show that it could be a very productive throughput device, which allows us to perform more science 
and get on job of doing uh, data analysis and uh, producing good outcomes for these species. However, that's not the end of it because this was only a pilot and it still needs to be brought to production. This model was trained only on single species calls and anyone familiar with frogs will know they don't like to wait their turn to call. And even though in an example I just gave, there was a duet going in there and the model performed very well, there are certain situations where lots and lots of frogs are calling at the same time and the model has not been trained on that as yet. We've just got to get around to that. We didn't have time in the pilot. We had to pick our battles. That will certainly be our next uh, step in the training of this model. Obviously, some of those species we've got very, very uh, few uh, training exemplars for, and we've got to even up those numbers and perhaps even include other species as well. Also, we need a much wider definition of what is not a frog. We have selected from the sound files we've got uh, various things that we've heard, such as people talking in the background, cockatoos, whistlers are very common, etc. But across the 470,000 files we have, there are going to be all sorts of sounds. There will be thunderstorms, uh, chainsaws, cars. We've got, I know there's one with an aeroplane taking off in the background. All of those sounds also have to be defined as not a frog, and we've got ways of doing that. I'm actually about 50% through that, uh, of supplying extra sounds to say these are definitely not a frog. And finally, we need to streamline the software such as more of a product rather than a research uh, tool at the moment. So where to from here? Well, we've done this for frogs. Uh, this week, I'm planning on looking at bats and applying this to bat call recordings. Uh, they've got exactly the same sort of problems, lots of recordings, uh, and it takes a long time to uh, process those. But also we can apply these to all sorts of animals and birds. Uh, we're hoping within the next year to look at bristle birds and also other beasts. You could be look, listening for feral goats, for instance. Um, maybe you could set up recorders uh, in a bushfire area and work out which species are, are migrating back to those areas as the area recovers and are they feral species that are causing issues. Eventually I'd like that ARI or Victoria has its own bioacoustic library. There has been a um, national library uh, being set up by QUT and others uh, I think Victoria needs to contribute to that and also have uh, its own subsection of that of the species that we have here. And then we'd be able to uh, cater uh, different models for different species by just pulling up the data we have. We'd also be able to reuse the data such as these, these frog files could later be analysed for sacred kingfisher or for owls, for instance. And all of these things could lead to um, increased monitoring and better management. And these could be improved outcomes for our native species and for the environment in general. So it's a very exciting future using this type of technology. And, uh, and that's it. Thank you very much. And I'm happy to have your questions. Hey, hey. everybody. Applauding. <laughs> that was fantastic. It is it is so exciting. It's uh, terrific work and I love the way that it is built on other work and we I can see in the questions that lots of people are thinking about the applications of this and how it might be applied in a whole lot of other ways. Um, just before we get to the questions, I have to say that I now have a favourite quote for Science Week. It's going to be that this is a confusion matrix to die for. I, I just love that line. So that's my, so far, that's my favourite quote of Science Week. But I see we do have a few questions. Andy, what would you like to lead us through a few of those and then we'll get to Jan's PowerPoint presentation. We can't hear you, Andy. I can't hear you. <laughs> my bad, sorry, I'm still on mute. Uh, there's some great questions and keep sending them through. Um, 
one of them, actually a couple of them relate to, I guess, the applications of the software and the uh, most apparent one for people has been Frog ID. Are there any plans to um, share this data method or use this in similar projects such as Frog ID? These tools uh, certainly can be uh, used widely and for instance, um, Shazam uses it on your phone or those sorts of apps. Uh, can do that sort of real time application that requires a, a very large back end, which uh, we're not really in the business of doing. However, uh, we could uh, supply the know how and also um, be partners on projects to apply these to different species and different applications. So yes, I'd love to see it progress and eventually I imagine this this sort of thing will be widespread, but for the moment it's fairly complex, um, but certainly doable for other species and, and um, yeah. So please talk to us, come up with project ideas and um, I'm really looking forward to uh, getting into this space in a big way in the future. Thank you very much, Pete. Um, the next question, I guess, comes to you mentioned that the model's being trained on individual species. Um, someone's got a question about how many of in how many calls in the database are actually cacophonies of many individuals of multiple species calling simultaneously. We have got uh, we have got examples of that. However, we decided to uh, and they are marked as such. Uh, this model. The pilot was to differentiate between species to see, well, you know, does one species sound the same as another and does it often get confused? And I think we were um, fairly convincingly show, able to show that that was not the case. The next version of the model will use the choruses and also the cacophonies. Um, in order to do that, we've got to supply uh, more training data and also perhaps tweak the model eventually to be a multi-species output rather than a single species output. That is a slight variation on the model design, but that's definitely doable, doable but it was outside the scope of the pilot. We could only, uh, we have to tackle it incrementally. Um, I didn't want to come to the end of the pilot and be confused as to how well it was performing because we've added too many variables. So we're adding a variable at a time and making the adjustments as we go. Thank you, what an exciting future. Your next piece of work will be, Pete. That sounds very encouraging. Um, regarding, uh, I guess this is about the species that you've trained the model to listen for. Someone's asking, uh, what's the possibility of identifying a call of a frog that hasn't been included in your training set? Uh, well, in theory, that ha will have exactly the same rating as not a frog. If the the the, the, tra the training data uh, has been supplied with 15 classes, 14 of that of frogs and one of not a frog. And I would hope actually that if it hears a frog it's never heard of before in this case, it would put it into not a frog because that is the correct bin for this model. Uh, having said that, I have found that even the species with very few training data uh, can be identified fairly successfully, even if their numbers are way less than a lot of the other training data. Therefore, um, if there's certain frogs you are interested in, we can very quickly rehash such that it doesn't have 15 outputs, it has 16, 17, 18, 8, 20 outputs of various other species and add those in retrain the model very quickly and uh, look for those species. And then, as I said, the beauty of this system is that once we've got a new model, we can reprocess all of those 470,000 files over a weekend and suddenly have been looking for that new species or other species that we hadn't even included before. And we'd have indicators as to where that was. So it's a very efficient use of existing data. Thank you, Pete. That is incredible. Um, I could sit here for the rest of the afternoon and listen to answers to this long stream of questions here. A lot of them are about uh, application actually and where we could go from here, but we'll get you to have a look at the questions and when we send 
the email out with the recording link, we might actually um, collate a bit of an answer to a couple of these in that email to help people hear some of these um, responses. And, and of course, um, we'll make sure, I hope you don't mind, that your email address is in our email that we send out as well. So if people want to chat to you about some of these things, hopefully you won't be, um, you won't get a tsunami of emails about this, but <laughs> I'm sure there's some people that you'd really love to chat with about this work. Well, it's a very, very much a work in progress, um, but I'm very confident we can get a, a fantastic production tool out of this uh, that we'll be using uh, from here on in. Fantastic. And I imagine you'll probably answer some of these in the chat while we're here for the rest of this session as well. So thank you. Thank you. So thank you, Pete. And now we go on to John. Fantastic. Um, we're going to hear about putting ecological models to the test. How can we be sure that they're robust in doing the job that we want them to do? So intriguing talk coming up here. Thanks so much, John. I'll leave it to you. Thanks. And um, so I'm, I work and I'm presenting today on Bunurong lands. And so I'd like to acknowledge the Bunurong people as the traditional owners of these lands and pay my respects to their elders. Today I'm going to be talking about modelling um, in ecology and particularly why I think we should start putting our models out there a little bit more. So model is a really vague term. So I'm going to start my talk today with a bit of a discussion of what models are and particularly um, how, how models are used and how I use models. I then want to give some examples of different models that we're using in the Victorian Environmental Flows Monitoring and Assessment Program or VEFMAP. And last, I want to make a fairly brief case for why I think we should start really challenging our models and putting them to the test. Um, many, many people contribute to the work that I do, uh, but these six in particular, so Zeb, Jared, Adrian, Charles, Rob and Jim, uh, have contributed substantially to the work that I'm presenting today. Right, so you're probably all getting a bit sick of seeing images like this. So it's all over the news. Every article or report we see has something about COVID in it at the moment. Um, but I've included this um, image here and this reference to COVID because thanks to what's happened over the past year or two, um, many, many people are now much more familiar with models and how models are used than they otherwise would be. Um, and this constant focus on COVID and lockdowns has meant that we now regularly see graphics like this. And so this chart shows um, predicted COVID case numbers if under different scenarios of compliance with physical distancing. Um, I just wanted to include this picture here because it's precisely how we use models in much of our work. We build a model that tries to capture what we think is going on in a particular ecosystem and then we use that model to forecast forward and say what might happen under different scenarios and that obviously can form lots of dif different decisions around um, ecosystem management. So really broadly, a model in, in my mind is something that links inputs to outputs. Now, not every model is as simple as this, uh, but I think this captures most of at least what I do in my work. Now that link, that question mark in the middle there, or the, the model can be conceptual, it can be mathematical, it can be statistical, it can be numerical. So it can take lots of different forms and, and look, look very different depending on how you're using that model. But I think models are typically about one of two things. And so the first of these is inference. And so this is when we want to estimate that, that question mark in the middle there. So we might know or observe some inputs. We've usually observed some outputs as well. And we're asking how do these two things relate to one another? The second um, sort of common use of models is prediction. And so in the predictive case, we will know an input. We'll usually have some idea about what that question mark looks like. And we'll use that information to predict or estimate the output. Um, there are lots of different ways to do this, to, so to make that to make that link between inputs and outputs. And so when we haven't got much data or much um, idea of what's going on there, we can turn to experts. And so here we just say to experts, tell me what you think is happening here that links the input to the output. We can use theory. And so there's a whole lot of ecological theory out there that sort of says what we think should happen under certain circumstances and we can use that to inform 
um, how an input links to an output. And last and probably most commonly, we have data. And so often we'll observe some inputs and outputs and we will just use that with a statistical model to try and tell us what's going on. Uh, and I've presented these three things separately, but obviously you can also use them together. And I think models are a really, really nice way to actually um, tie together different sources of information, different types of knowledge. Now there's a tension in modeling uh, between simple models and more complex models. This tension really arises because I think generally simple often means feasible and more complex models can often be more challenging or more difficult to implement. Uh, in some cases, this complexity feasibility trade-off can also apply to accuracy and generality. And so in many cases, but not all, more complex models will be more accurate. And similarly, more complex models uh, can be more specific or less general. Um, that doesn't always apply, so I've left that as kind of a gray area here, but I think it's it's often the case. With all this, it's really difficult to know though, what is the right amount of complexity? Um, how complex should we make a model? And that, of course, like everything, the answer to that question is it depends. It comes down to what you're using that model for and what you want it to achieve. Uh, and so I wanted next to turn to some examples from the VEFMAP program to try and um, illustrate this spectrum of simple through to complex models and how they're used. One of the main motivations for a lot of what I do and a lot of what we do at ARI is keeping ecosystems, and in this case rivers, healthy. And so it's, it's no secret that rivers need water, and it gets pretty complex when we start dealing with regulated rivers, where water gets taken out or released at different times under the control of waterway managers. And so VEFMAP, or the Victorian Environmental Flows Monitoring and Assessment Program, was set up to monitor how ecosystems respond to flows, um, particularly environmental flows, which are water releases specifically targeting environmental outcomes. Now, within VEFMAP, we use a heap of different models to try and work out whether environmental flows achieve their purpose and also to support decisions around how flows are managed. So this ties back to that example of COVID scenarios I showed earlier, where we're comparing different options, um, different management options or scenarios based on the expected outcomes for the environment. So I'm focusing today on the fish component of FMAP, but there are other components too. Um, I tend to work with data and numbers in the computer mostly, but I wanted to start these examples off with a conceptual model. So I think this conceptual model actually lays out really nicely what we're working towards um, in all of our modeling efforts. And also it's just good to highlight, I think that not all models have to be maths, numbers, code, these sorts of things. So this conceptual model illustrates all the different processes that link flows and particularly environmental flows to fish. Um, one of the problems with this model for applications is it's not, it's not actually predictive. Uh, and so our goal and what I'm going to talk through in my next few examples is how we use is to use data and a little bit of ecological theory to try and build predictive models that capture some of the details in this conceptual model. Um, so this as a first example, I wanted to present a relatively simple statistical model that looks at trends in fish catch and relates these to flow. And so we did this for quite a few different species, but I'm just presenting Murray Cod in this example and in all the following examples as well. This model was set up to estimate how flow influences catch, but also to capture underlying trends in catch that might reflect declines or increases in populations irrespective of flow. Uh, so for example, this might occur when a population is unable to respond um, to a particular assumed to be a beneficial flow event, just because there might not be very many adults in reproductive condition in the population. Uh, and from this analysis, we get outputs a little bit like this. And so this uh, plot here shows the proportional change in population size through time. So you can see prior to 2010, so during the millennium drought, populations of Murray Cod in Victoria were generally either declining or possibly stable through time. And following the drought, so when the drought broke, you can see there were fairly consistent increases in populations through time. The model also gives us some idea about how different aspects of flow, uh, in this case, the number of low flow days affect catch. So this chart says that as probably expected, many, many days of low flow in a year are associated with low abundances of Murray Cod. Um, 
This is an example of a model used mostly for inference rather than prediction. So we're here we're interested in working out what's going on in that middle box there, the statistical model, rather than actually necessarily predicting future catches as a function of flow. It's quite a simple model, but it actually tells us quite a lot about how populations are tracking and how flow is contributing to this. And so this information can be passed on to water, waterway managers, and it was in this case, um, who can then assess whether what they're doing is working uh, and also gives them an idea of what they might do in future to improve population trends. So now I want to move on to a second example where we're starting to add a little bit of complexity to this model. And so this addresses or looks at similar questions to the previous example, but now we're focusing on recruitment. So a specific biological process rather than the more broad abundance catch type measures. So our goal in this work was to work out how the number of recruits that we see, and again, Murray Card is the focus of this work, how the number of recruits was influenced by flow. Uh, a challenge for this is that sampling recruits or at least identifying recruits can be quite hard. And so we had to add a second sub model to this um, that allowed us to backtrack from a fish's length, which is what we typically measure and observe in the field, to its age. And so how older a given fish was, which we can use to then work out uh, when that fish recruited, when it was uh, its year of recruitment. So this analysis required some additional data, which we get from otoliths. And so otoliths provide us a link between a fish's length and its age. So I think this is in its own, on its on its own is a nice example of how we can use a model to tie together different pieces of information. Now the primary output of this model was an estimate of how flow influenced recruitment in each of five different rivers. Um, with, you can see there's quite different effects in the five different rivers here. And so in this plot here, we've got the, um, the effect of the proportional variability or the flashiness of flows during the spawning period on estimated number of recruits. And the black line there to the ward's left is the Murray River. And you can see that's got it's quite a strong decline as flows get more flashy. And by contrast, the Ovens River in purple at the top there has a, an actual increase as flows get more flashy. And so there's quite different effects in these different rivers. Um, and so clearly that was an, a level of complexity that was necessary for this model um, to sort of make sense. And we see a similar pattern, perhaps less strong in other flow variables. And so this chart here shows the effects of spring flow. So flows during the spring period on number of recruits in each of those five rivers again. Now this is still a relatively simple model, uh, but it tells us quite a lot about how flow influences reproduction in that early survival period, which are really, really important ecological processes. So moving on to another example now, this one adds a whole lot more complexity to this this approach. So we're still considering the same sort of question, how does flow influence fish populations? But now we're looking at all life stages simultaneously and adding in an explicit model of population dynamics. And so that's the process model there. And now we're trying to get something in here that has a mathematical equation there that captures how ecological populations work. And the reason we want that is because having a process model gives us a much stronger link uh, to predictive models. And so we can use that process model to start to predict like in the COVID case from earlier, what might happen under different scenarios. So this analysis uses length and age as I did in the previous example to try and estimate a number of fish recruiting and also those transitions between different age classes. Um, but we also add information for a mark recapture study to try and estimate detectability and immigration and immigration. So the output from this uh, whole approach looks a little bit like this. And so this might not mean much in this form, but it's really capturing the guts of that process model. And it tells us about how how likely fish are to move between different size classes, um, and also tells us something about how, um, how likely fish are to reproduce. And there's a flow component to this too, so it says what might that output look like under different flow conditions. I should mention this is an earlier version of the model that was built on weight rather than length. Um, that's been, since been updated to focus on length, hence the use of length data in the example here. Uh, and that process model gives us predictions that look a little bit like this. And so the jagged black line to the left here is observed abundances of Murray cod through time. The solid smooth black line is the mean predicted or mean fitted abundance. And those colored lines to the right show us mean predicted abundances 
under a range of uncertainty there. So there's some idea about what we might expect in the future, um, accounting for the fact that we don't really know what the future holds. And I should mention here that Charles Todd at ARI has done a lot of work on these sorts of models. Uh, and Charles's models include not just flows, but a heap of the other elements from that conceptual model I showed earlier. And so they're really, really, a really useful tool to try and piece together what's going on and then predict what might happen under different management scenarios. So I wanted to round out these examples with one more example of where we're going. And so this is models of multiple species. And so things are starting to get really complex now. Um, we're now dealing with multiple age classes, um, so multiple life stages of each species, but also multiple species and particularly their interactions. Uh, and so given the complexity of these models, we haven't yet got to um, using statistical models in that sort of combined framework that has process model, statistical model and data all wrapped up in one. Um, we're really just using a process model at this stage to tie together what we think we know about population dynamics. Um, and importantly, the interactions among species. And I should stress that what we think we know about population dynamics is often built on data. So these models aren't um, uninformed by data. There's still plenty of data and past knowledge going into them, um, but they're not explicitly incorporating all that in one framework. So just give myself a bit of room here. Um, these models are really fun, but they have a heap of moving parts. And so in my mind, when I'm sort of developing these multi-species type models, I kind of expect something like this a little bit, where you know it's a nice, clean output where species have this wonderful interplay interactions um, and you know move up and down in sync or in tandem. The reality is actually a little bit more like this, and so we get outputs where we just have a whole lot of possibly noise, possibly real uncertainty. We just don't quite know what's going on there, and it can be very, very messy and very hard to pull out general rules, general trends, that sort of thing. So this brings me to my the point of my talk, really. Um, how do we know if a model's any good? We have this spectrum from simple to more complex models, and they all give different outputs. Uh, and using this really, really messy output from my last example, there's a really, really important question there of, well, is it correct? Is it right? Is it any good? Um, to work this out, obviously, we need to test our models. And ecologists do this. But I don't think ecologists necessarily test our models as rigorously as other disciplines do. So many of us probably look at forecasts like this fairly regularly. Um, some of us probably rely on them for our work. And I imagine if you do field work, you're looking at forecasts like this maybe multiple times a day, multiple times an hour even. I don't see any reason why ecologists couldn't aim towards something similar. Um, the key ingredient in all this is there's lots of forecasts. These forecasts are readily available. Um, and I guess the sub point there is that people care about them. People want those forecasts. These forecasts are tested against data. And really importantly, once those tests are completed, the models are updated. So this is where we're headed with the VEFMAP program and several other projects at ARI. Um, our current focus in this work is looking at population models. And so those population models I introduced in the last few examples before. Um, I think population models, I like these because they're a really, really great example of how we can link that or build that input to output link by combining expert knowledge, ecological theory, and also some data. And so we combine all these things together to build up an idea of what's going on. Um, we regularly already use population models to forecast, to try and predict what we think might happen under certain circumstances or certain scenarios. And so in the case of VEFMAP, um, we focus on predictions for lots of things that we can measure. And so that's abundance, recruitment, um, age or size structure of particular populations. And we have these predictions made across lots of sites, lots of populations. Um, and so the final step in all this, and I should stress, this is stuff we already do in our current work. The final step, though, and what I think we aren't doing quite as much as we could, is to start testing and updating our models. Now, of course, we, we do test our models. We do ground truth and we work out whether they're you know, giving us sensible outputs. But I think we can take a leaf out of the weather forecasting book here and really ramp up those tests. Um, 
Unlike weather forecasters, our real challenge is that we only tend to get data once, maybe twice a year, and possibly at a few dozen sites if we're lucky. Um, so we haven't got observation networks set up across thousands of sites, you know, measuring everything every hour. Um, so we need to get kind of clever and use a range of different tests. And so in the case of the VEFMAP program, we're using a few different tests. One is near-term forecasts. So looking one or two years into the future and seeing what, what, what do our models predict? And then we go back and reevaluate that um, in the future and see if those models were actually correct. Using hindcasts, so using past knowledge, say back in the year 2000 or prior to that, to build a model that predicts the next 10 or 15 years and see how would that model have done? And finally, we use transferability tests. So looking at how a model that's built in one place might actually predict in a different location. What's missing and what we haven't really nailed down yet is, is a consistent process to update our models following tests. And so I think the real question here is what is good enough in terms of a model? And on this, in that sort of vein, I find Peter's results from the previous talk really quite daunting because I personally have never ever seen um, model performance is up in the 90% plus range, and that's really, really amazing stuff. Um, but that's really why I chose this topic today, because I know a lot of people will have grappled with these questions, um, and I really just want to raise this as something that I'm thinking about. I'm sure others are thinking about it, and it'd be really, really nice to um, work on these problems in tandem. So I'm going to wrap up now, but I've got a couple of final thoughts here. Um, First of all, I do love to chat to people, so I think it's always really great to share experiences, talk through ideas and hopefully learn some things through a more collaborative uh, effort. My goal with much of what I'm doing is to make testing and updating models easy. And so a big part of this in my mind is good software and good data management. And so that's where I spend a lot of my time. And I, again, would love to chat if that's something that interests you or if you um, have thoughts relevant to that. Uh, and the real challenge for this, though, I think is that last point on my previous slide, which is that we just, how do we know where models are good enough? Uh, and this ultimately comes back to what the model is used for, um, who's using the model and possibly who's funding or interested in the model. Um, but I think it would be really useful to find some general rules of thumb or general trends in this space. Thank you very much for listening. Bravo, John. Thank you so much. That was uh, a wonderful talk, and I love the way that you know many many models. I think are seen as mysterious black boxes by people, but you've opened up that box and helped us um, see inside with clarity and understanding of what they do and how they can be applied and some of the questions that we should be asking of them. So, thank you. I enjoyed that a lot. Um, I'm just checking for questions. Um, Andy, questions. Just looking over to the chat, the stream there. Um, I've got one question here from a uh, watcher, and it's just disappeared yeah, in front of my face. So I'm just going to have to bring that up again, and it's giving a spinning wheel of death. But, but in exactly the meantime, to me. <laughs> I'm going to. Oh, here we go. Um, there's an anonymous uh, watcher, Jean, and he is curious about what the accuracy of the models have been. So in, in terms of when you've done those tests and sent things back to, to validate them, um, what do they look like? Yeah, so it's quite um, amazing. That's why I said Peter's talk was quite daunting to me because typically in ecology or in, sorry, the work I'm doing will typically see accuracies of maybe 20%. And so it's, I just, even being generous, I don't know that that's enough to trust a model into the future when you're making long-term predictions and things. So that's kind of a, it is often quite low. And I think there's a tendency or a, um, yeah, there's a tendency to attribute that to uncertainty and the fact that ecology is highly uncertain, things are messy, um, measurement error, all sorts of things are going on. Um, but I do wonder if we start rolling out these tests, and this is a sort of the more um, prospective part of my talk is if we start rolling these tests out at more places, more times in more rigorously, whether we actually see that's, that's the true result or whether it's worse than that or whether it's better than that. I think that's just an open question at this stage. Thank you very much, Jan. Um, I've got a question. You mentioned that uh, moving forward with the more this more rigorous testing, uh, that you need lots of forecasts. It needs to be really available for people to um, interrogate them. You need you want people to actually be interested in them. 
Um, and also you need data to test against. Do you see citizen science as being a interesting way to get more data and people actually looking back at these models in the community? Yeah, 100%. I think this is something about, um, it's almost about making models available as much as anything else. So putting models out there so people can just click a website. And if, again, we've seen this uh, on in the COVID examples. There are many, many COVID dashboards and forecasts and things out there. Having that sort of, um, I guess, infrastructure in place where the models are available and then having an option of people to upload their own observations or query observations, that sort of stuff is really um, part of it. And I think, yeah, I say testing. Testing isn't always going to be data. It could be people just saying, no, that's rubbish. That model makes no sense. That couldn't possibly be there. Well, that, that sort of thing matters too. Um, and I think just getting, making things accessible and putting things out there is the first step towards that. Awesome. Um, I've got a last question here, uh, which we have time for. He's asking, uh, considering the principles, I guess, of Occam's razor and favoring models with more, I can't even say this word, it's parsimonious, parsimonious complexity. Um, he's wondering, should we be including those principles more in ecology? And I guess treating the simplistic ones more uh, kindly. Yeah, I think if you asked me 10 years ago, I would have said definitely because I was really obsessed with theory and mathematical models and, you know, simple general principles that explained everything. I think, and again, just to reference Peter's talk, you look at that sort of stuff, that these aren't necessarily simple, easy models to build or work with, um, but they work amazingly well. And so the real test of these models in my, my mind is actually uh, what relates back to their purpose, but if our purpose is prediction, the test is how well do they predict. So you use a model to predict what you think might happen. If that prediction is correct, I personally for applications don't really mind how simple or complex that model is. Um, but yes, I do in the the broader science ecological side of things, I do think there's plenty of merit to simpler models just from an elegance perspective, let alone an understanding perspective. Perfect. Uh, you answered that so succinctly. I've got one more for you. Um, <laughs> There's a question about how we actually test models in the future. Do we have to wait to see those uh, play out or is there an opportunity to say that was quite an accurate model, it just didn't happen? Yeah, that's a really, really great question and a really tricky one to answer. So short answer, yes, you do typically need to wait until the future to see if your model was any good. Um, and obviously in many cases we're dealing with hypotheticals or scenarios that may or may not occur. And so that can get really, really tricky or just impossible. I think. That's part of the reason I'm focusing on those near term forecasts and so looking one or two years into the future, because for the lifetime of many projects we're working on, one or two years into the future is actually within a project. And so that's manageable. We can do that. We can say we're going to make predictions for next year and then we'll test it. And obviously we start that now in 10 years time. We've been doing it for 10 years and that's a, a great start. I think the other side of that is, um, and this might actually tie back to the previous question about parsimony is, and one of the reasons I use those population models, these models based on ecological processes, is because they're things we can measure in the shorter term. And so I might make a prediction that we expect abundances to change by 10, 20, 30% over 20 years, but that prediction is actually based on really fundamental core ecological process, processes that happen in real time. And so it's things we can measure tomorrow, measure now. And like I said, this model is built on an assumption that recruitment does this. And so we can go out and test that part of the model. And once we've got it, a good idea of whether that's okay or not, we can then have a little bit more faith in our overall model projections that might not directly be testable. Thank you, John. Thank you for answering those questions. Thank you so much for your talk. And, you know, in these times in which um, models are so much a part of our life now, whether it's fish and water or whether it's COVID or climate change, um, there's a big part of how we live in the world today and I really thank you for drawing our attention to thinking really critically about them today. Thank you to you and to Peter um, and to Andy and Lou in the background for helping us with tech today. It's been another terrific ARI seminar and a fantastic start to National Science Week for us. Oh, Zeb in the background as well. Thank you. <laughs> um, thank you all. Thanks to everybody who came along today. There will, of course, be a recording of this session on the ARO website within a few days. Jump on there and check it out. And if you're not normally a subscriber to this, um, go and subscribe and then you'll find out about the next one. The next one is the 
8th of September, I think. 13th. 13th. The 13th. <laughs> Tell us about it, Andy. Oh, OK. You, you're pulling my arm. Um, yeah, 13th of September, we've got a really great seminar about bushfire recovery of many different species. Um, it will be part of the uh, Biodiversity Month celebrations, but also feature in the Victorian Nature Festival, which is another spectacular event that's going to be happening during Biodiversity Month. Um, if you haven't heard of the Nature Festival, I encourage you to look it up. Um, and if you haven't seen what ARI has been doing in collaboration with many other great partners, including Zoos Victoria, DELP um, and Parks Victoria, check out our website. We've got some really great stories about the fish recoveries, um, looking after the reptiles in the alpine areas, as well as some of the other vegetation stories. So uh, much more to discover if you're looking for things to do during Science Week. We could keep talking advertisements all day, couldn't we? <laughs> But happy National Science Week, everybody. Thanks again to Jan, Peter, Andy, Zeb, Lou, and Katie for initiating all that work as well. Fantastic. Have a good Science Week, everyone. Bye.